What does it take for us to build workplaces and a world that is fit for the future? A question that plagues many a leader and many an organization. How do we learn from our experiences? Are we shaping ourselves and our workplaces to be fit for the future? What does it take to invest in people and nurture success? How do we ensure that our investments in diversity, equity and inclusion are delivering to the intended goals? Are we seeing the very invisible responsibility that most employees carry, that of being caregivers? What does it take to build a caregiver-friendly workplace? Are leaders caregivers? What can leaders and organizations learn from caregivers and their experiences? How do we create safe spaces that enable inclusion? Is this something that is holding especially women back from the C-suite. We are delighted to bring to you a series of conversations around the idea of building future fit corporate. Abhijit Bhadri, in addition to being a senior colleague, someone I have deeply admired and respected over years, uh, is a talent management advisor to firms. He is among the 10 most sought after brand evangelists and is highly sought after coach and mentor to leaders in different stages of their career. He headed learning and development globally at Microsoft. Prior to joining Microsoft, he worked as a strategic advisor and executive coach to business leaders and organizations in transition. His clients ranged from Fortune 100 companies to startups and large Indian organizations. He is rated among the top 10 learning experts globally and is a LinkedIn top voice. He was the brand evangelist for Society for Human Resource Management, India and APAC, and a global influencer for brand Adobe. His weekly newsletter has more than 300,000 subscribers. Wow, that's many zeros, Abhijit and a powerful voice shaping the profession. He has been described by the Forbes magazine as one of, the, one of India's most interesting globalists and has been voted as number one HR influencer on social media by SHRM. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. It's an honor and uh, I've had such interesting conversations with you and you're doing something uh, new so um, frequently. I would like to take uh, a moment for you to tell us more than this introduction. What is the latest in your side of the world? Um, well, thank you, Bhavna. Uh, first of all, I'm a big admirer of the work that you are doing in terms of uh, really bringing this to the consciousness, you know, to make the invisible visible is probably one of the biggest things that we can do uh, as uh, people who are shaping uh, different conversations. Um, I have just, you know, recently written a uh, book. Where, this is the one uh, called Career 3.0. And uh, the purpose of the book is to actually talk about how um, careers are getting reshaped uh, because of a different set of reasons. Uh, you know, uh, people are living longer uh, the employer's lifespan has dropped to barely the teens. Uh, skills are, uh, you know, barely have a lifespan of about two and a half, three years. Uh, with this, uh, you know, you think about all the shifts that are happening, you know, with the, the demographic shifts that are happening. People are living longer, which also means that, you know, therefore there needs to be caregiving. So it's a very relevant area. Uh, while I have focused only on the career aspects of it, but career is our journey through life. So in that sense, uh, through different stages, uh, you know, people's responses change to their profession and how they view it. So this is the world that I have written about. It's fascinating. And I see so many points of intersection there. Uh, so let's say workplaces of the future will need to be different than how we have been thus far. And people mm -hmm. who make decisions in such workplaces will need to take into account new ways of being. One of the things that we have pushed for is diversity in leadership, leadership positions and said that, you know, at least we should have gender diversity. 
But we have found that um, whilst there has been a lot of effort to improve the supply, so to speak, mm -hmm. there seems to be a leaky pipeline to the C-suite. Mm -hmm. Women seem to be steadily falling mm -hmm. off the workforce for a variety of reasons. What have been your experiences and insights? Um, so I think when you look at the talent pipeline, uh, you know, there are two kinds of uh, filters to uh, use when you're looking at talent. One is, you know, to look at what are the visible differences. Gender is a good example of that. Uh, visible differences uh, that you have to sort of make sure that the visible differences are equally represented uh, or adequately represented. Uh, in the workforce, in the talent pool, because, uh, you know, a lot of the innovation comes from diversity of thought. You, you get alternative points of view, you reflect the customer uh, much better, etc. I mean, there's enough documentation and research on that part. There's also another filter, which is the invisible uh, lens through which when you look at it, you know, so whether it is, uh, you know, whether it's religion or whether it's uh, sexual orientation, whether it's uh, 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 you know, challenges that we are experiencing as far as mental health is concerned, etc. A whole lot of things which are yeah. uh, not immediately discernible. Uh, that's another lens. So we need to use these two lenses as we are talking uh, about the talent pool that we are looking at. Are these adequately uh, sort of represented? Two, I also think that this is also a time when you have to sort of say that uh, in a world which is graying, you know, and talent pools are really shrinking, organizations have to really start to reimagine the way that they have looked at, you know, attracting talent, retaining talent, developing talent. In all three stages, there is a need to uh, rethink the equation. One of the things that, um, you know, uh, I have often wondered about is that when you talk about startups, you really worry about the CAC or the CSC, the customer acquisition costs and the customer long term value. And I think there is an analogy there for organizations to worry about the cost of hiring someone and the cost of retaining someone over a period of time. There are clear benefits of having employees that last long enough in an organization and uh, have a lot of uh, not so apparent knowledge of the culture, the organization, the business per se. And uh, leaders can do well to tap into that. But for some reason, we may need to shift how people will stay longer in organizations. What do you see are some of the demographic shifts or mindset shifts that might be happening that uh, people may not want to stay longer in organizations? So I think, you know, in, in my book, Career 3.0, I actually talk about this framework uh, that we can use, um, which is uh, you need to have three buckets. One is, uh, you know, changes that are happening in the way that you do the work. So uh, mm -hmm. the best example is how generative AI is changing the way we work. You know, it can uh, create movies, it can write scripts, it can do, you know, et cetera, all of that. So there is the way that we are working is going to shift, is shifting. So that's in transition. The moment you change the way of working, you also automatically have another piece which changes, which is the skills uh, of the talent pool. So your talent pool portfolio of skills, uh, you know, you've got to divide it in three categories. What is it that will be done now by technology? What is it that's going to be done augmenting uh, the human being? And what will remain uh, a human skill altogether? So in each role of the organization, you will see this. The third piece is, in view of these two shifts that we described, how is the workplace responding? You know, So whether it is in terms of policies, whether it's in terms of, you know, a good example is when we change the way of working, even in a very sort of, you know, post-COVID world, if you see, what we did was as soon as COVID got over and we said, 
okay, now that COVID is over, we need to go back and sort of look at life exactly the way it was before. And it's not going to happen because there is a significant break from the past. So the moment you have a break, you have to rethink this equation, work, worker and workplace. All three of them will need to change. And that is the most fundamental piece that leaders have to provide thought to. You talked about customer acquisition cost. Anything that you're doing with the customer, you should be doing with the employees because that's the only way the two are going to stay in tandem. So if you think the customer needs to be represented, the mirror image has to be inside the organization. Uh, So those are some of the obvious ways in which organizations need to rethink what they are doing. I would like for you to tap into memory and the many organizations, wonderful organizations that you have led, uh, your teams that you have led and found some of the typical challenges that uh, both men and women face or challenges that are different for women or men and that enable or uh, disable them from reaching the C-suite. So I think, um, you know, one of the ways to sort of really look at careers, you know, and Mm -hmm. I've been fascinated by that uh, in the course of writing this book, I got a chance to interview people across the world. And really fascinating to see um, that there are some things which don't change. So, for example, when I was, uh, you know, when my children were being born, um, one of the problems that I had was that I just couldn't sort of time that, uh, you know, the paternity leave, because mm. you just don't know, because the kid, you kind of think that there is a due date. And my kid happened, uh, you know, a couple of days uh, later in one case. And the second case, to probably make up for it, the kid happened earlier. The moment you do that, all your planning in terms of, you know, we wanted the parents to be there for support, all of that. In both the cases, we were left with managing two young kids, you know, and my work and my wife's work and everything. And so you kind of really, it puts everything into a tizzy. We were lucky that we were in a place where we were able to find people to support us during that in different phases, different people. But now when I look at others around me as I live and work out of US, I mean, it's a completely different world altogether. And it's the same thing because hospitals, because of their costs, don't keep the uh, you know the uh, the people there after childbirth for a very long time yes. so in 24 hours they by and large send the person back and you know the companies which give paternity leave of two weeks expect the man to be back and then in we know that in reality this is not something that happens so the places which have more women in the workforce are the ones, the countries, you know, in many of the Scandinavian countries, Nordic countries, where you have longer uh, maternity benefits. You know, Russia right. has a longer uh, maternity benefit, etc. So when you have that, it actually encourages more people to sort of go back. So this whole notion that you are going to be in the workplace at one shot, you will join at, in your 20s and retire at some point of time, whenever that is. Uh, even there, there is no consistency. You know, in the Air Force, you retire at a certain age. In the Army, you retire at a certain age. If you are a field marshal, you retire at a certain age. If you are a captain, you retire at a certain age. There's no consistency in any of these. That's right. Um, so, so when you look at that in this every stage, if you get married, you know, then it generates a certain kind of thing that how do you work? If your spouse lives and works in a different time zone or a different uh, uh, city or works a different shift, there are all kinds of scenarios. So I don't think we have been able to really rethink work as it should be done for the world that we live in today with, you know, all the societal shifts that have happened, you know, all that. So I just think this is a piece which is really needs to be reassembled. 
I agree with you so much that there are so many, I mean, it's, it's really a different world where, you know, um, now you have both, uh, you know, a working couple uh, and having two sets of parents, sometimes uh, a couple of children, sometimes a couple of pets uh, to look after and sometimes perhaps inherited uh, other older adults because cousins are in other countries. And, um, you know, the role of the caregiver is uh, so much wider. And sometimes we might have employees who are not actively caregivers or supporting in the daily living of people, but uh, uh, being a long distance caregiver. And this has uh, implications in terms of worrying, in terms of being hyper vigilant. I mean, if my daughter is in the hostel, I am thinking about her. Uh, or parents for that matter. And uh, this does have a bearing on my presence, my ability, my mental space, um, and my ability to consistently uh, deliver uh, or be an instrument of performance at the workplace. Uh, and um, there is interesting statistic, Abhijay, that uh, women disproportionately carry the load of uh, unpaid yeah. care work. And uh, we've spoken about that in the past, and it is a very, very large number. And even if facilities are available, you were telling me something very interesting about paternal leave, paternity leave. And yeah. uh, I would like for us, you to help us understand mm -hmm. the social pressures despite having good policies. So organizations think or HR people, my fraternity, might think that we have put in place a policy, but there is a difference in putting in place a policy and it being in practice. Please tell us a little more about that. So, uh, you know, this was a conversation I was having with uh, somebody who I coach and, you know, the challenge that the person is having is uh, that the person has just had a, a baby, you know, very recently. And the challenge is that uh, the person has been, you know, sent away, uh, is going to be sent away for a very prestigious uh, assignment given to a high potential employee. And, uh, uh, you know, the person actually works in an organization which gives a certain kind of paternity leave, which is right. it's not enough, but it's certainly better than what most uh, companies yes. offer. And so he went to apply for paternity leave. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, his manager uh, sort of, you know, said, OK, let's discuss this over coffee, took him aside and said, you are in the high potential program. And if you now mess it up by, you know, uh, taking paternity leave, you will be sidelined and, you know, people will not take you seriously. Now, I was just telling this person, imagine what happens when because the woman has much longer maternity leave by yeah. law. Uh, yeah. So it's not surprising if you find this discrimination today, um, yeah. uh, you know, it is going to uh, sort of be uh, very easy to figure out that women must be facing a much larger version of this. I think when you think about caregiving, the real mm -hmm. operative word in my view is the moment you are a person who cares, you know, has an emotion, you're sensitive mm -hmm. to that, you care yeah. about a relationship. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. whether with a human being or with a pet, I mean, you know, or the, are, planet. Uh, uh, or the planet and anything that you have a care for, yes, you care about, you know, is going to demand time. Otherwise, you don't care. I mean, yes. there are a nice. million issues in the world uh, mm. and not all of us are equally passionate about all of them. But anything mm. that you care about, you devote time. Care is yeah. reflected by time. Yeah. Whether that's for older parents, you know, mm -hmm. distant relatives who you might be caring on behalf of a cousin or, you know, extended family. Yes. It could be your pet. It could be your own children. It could be your yes. own fertility issues. It could be your, uh, uh, you know, life situations such as marriages, uh, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, for every possible scenario where you need to show your care, it is going to impact your uh, that time that you are devoting to work in the role that you do. So this process of caregiving cannot be left to the individual to sort of do it discreetly behind uh, uh, closed doors. Uh, 
It's right. no longer that world that we live in. So it will have to be done in a way. It is part of a talent management initiative. How do you how do you nurture that talent? Because yeah. if you have a transactional view of talent that, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to sort of really look at you as a uh, skill delivery mechanism. Yes. Uh, if that's how I view you in a transactional way. I'm not surprised that, you know, when you look at the uh, uh, Gallup poll data points on employee engagement, I mean, it's okay. terrible that the really truly engaged workforce is barely 30 percent, I mean, you know, 30, 32 yeah. percent, 32 percent yeah. is the real number. Yeah. It's not surprising because yeah. the employees cannot feel that, uh, you know, they have no opportunity to care. But when mm -hmm. it comes to their work, they have to care. It cannot yeah. happen selectively. Yes. So I think this is this is the world we are living in. I so resonate with what you say that, you know, it is I can think about uh, some of the managers that I deeply care about who uh, were very instrumental in my life life stages. Uh, you know, at the time that I had caregiving responsibilities, obviously, I, I may or may not have spoken about it, but they really cared for me in the sense that one whether or not I said anything to them, or two, they kind of, you know, I was quite a rebellious uh, team member to have, so I must have been a handful. I sometimes think about that. But, uh, you know, they were great, compassionate managers who, um, one, let me be who I was, and two, accommodated my uh, circumstances in a certain way even today, if they were to call me for anything, I would give an arm and a leg and not even think about it because I feel I owe them. Yeah. And uh, I think that's what you're alluding to, that if we do want to build sustainable capacity in an organization or talent, then we might have to think go beyond the transactional nature. What would you advise CEOs, CFOs, uh, to think about as they shape organizations of the future and become cognizant that, let's say in India, as per the BCG report, nearly 88% of the employees will, uh, you know, are identify as caregivers or, you know, recognize that they have caregiving responsibilities. Uh, and, you know, I think of, of what you mentioned is absolutely correct that, um, you know, when you look at by country, you know, yes. take for example India. Um, you know, you have a scenario where there are a couple of none of these things are a result of one single factor. Uh, yes, so yes. you know, there is um, urbanization. So people are moving from rural uh, setups. People are giving up professions that they have historically done. For example, farmers' children, by and large, don't want to be farmers anymore. They're sort of looking at different professions. There are professions which don't pay just as well. People are abandoning those and sort of doing it. So there is a shift for multiple reasons. This, uh, the next piece to sort of really think about it is when you look at the workforce and you look at all the factors that are changing with them, how do you look at this as a talent management issue? So, for example, uh, a, a notion like, uh, you know, retirement. I mean, there are tons of people who retired because they hit a certain day and age. And, yes. you know, there could be somebody who is unskilled. And I'm not saying that you need to do that as an act of charity, but smart decision making to really start questioning the assumptions on which talent management has been done in the industrial world. And it's not the industrial world now. And therefore, it's pointless just as much as, you know, I think we change our, um, um, you know, mindset uh, less frequently than what we change our mobile phones. So I think this is a uh, it's something for us to think about the assumptions with which um, in, in, in a country like India, if there are challenges that people have or stigmas on certain conditions, invisible conditions, whether it's mental health or same sex partners, etc., in those cases, to be extra sensitive, to figure out how do we make sure that we look at that as a talent management issue and create policies to address that, which obviously means how do they continue to bring their full self to work when we say that? 
it means that their caregiving responsibilities are taken into account as we, when we hire people because most people don't say that anymore it's this is the same equivalent that we used to have at one point of time hopefully uh, you know for variety of reasons and law changes etc that has diminished but there was a point of time women would be routinely asked in job interviews are you married do you intend to get pregnant thankfully that is now you know diminished but when you look at that in the same way to be able to ask people i don't think we asked that in an interview that do you have caregiving responsibilities and what would that mean you know so in some countries is perfectly okay to tell an employer that i uh, you know i can work only till you know 3 o'clock in the afternoon and thereafter i have to uh, be there or i will come into the office only at 11 because uh, you know my husband works the night shift and is back only at 10 i hand over the caregiving responsibility and then sort of do that and etc i mean the, i've just taken two examples but this is the reality and we need to rethink talent management uh, from this lens um i'm going to um, you know try and go a little deeper into what does it mean to be sensitive to something like this so let's say there is an hr manager or uh, you know a leader and uh, we who has taken to our conversation and who says okay we are going to be a little more sensitive to these changing needs but they have pressures that you know we can hire only so many people we cannot really have so much slack uh you know this is mounting costs on us what are some ways in which to look at some of these investments in order to be able to justify this um uh, to an organization or somebody who is making decisions around budgets and costs so um, i think the way uh, bhavna i would sort of really look at it from the point of view of um uh, you know some of the principles or uh, design principles around your talent management policy and if the design principle is that we need diversity of talent to be able to because it's a business need to you know uh, get better ideas and more innovation or mirror the customer uh, your reasons could be many fold or in some cases you have that the the skill that you need most good example of that is you know like a chip design you know for yeah. companies uh, there just aren't enough people who know how to do some of the cutting edge That's work in that they just isn't you're competing fiercely for the resources that you know that one person could make or break the scenario yeah in those cases you know sort of not being able to offer that Uh, is just such a uh, such a way to kill that talent pool you know yeah secondly when you are looking at uh, as you are looking at not just rare skills but also rare experience combinations because there right. are you know there are some people who have had that they build that soft skills which are nurtured and nourished over a span of time uh you know just because the person cannot come into the office sometime we make that provision that you work from anywhere but for god's sake do this mm-hmm. i just think that we need to really start to put all the qu- talent management design principles on the table look at that and say what is the way to make that work so you know i talked about work the worker which is the talent pool the skills mm-hmm. that you need mm-hmm. and the workplace Mm. the workplace must really figure out that there are jobs that you can do through part time work there are jobs you can bring in as a consultant there are jobs which you can do as a project there are jobs that you can do through internships there are jobs which you can do through cross functional move there's infinite amount of combinations which are possible so therefore when somebody says we can't do it i don't buy that i just think that it is a way of making sure it's just like when you say that i'm going to expand it to a different country you really study the market you really try to study and what are the nuances of that market what language should the ad be in are we culturally sensitive to those all of that you need to bring those elements into the talent management process so it is you know you have to look at talent management from uh, we now we talk about skills first uh, hiring Uh, so yes. that's of course you know which what you see happening 
but skills first hiring needs to be supplemented with you know bringing the full person into the workplace right. so it just can't be that you know you are just you know taking those five fingers of mine and leaving the rest of the body behind that can't mm -hmm. work nice uh, i really like some of the uh, metaphors that you have drawn or made it come alive with um talking about skills there is a very large pool of people who take a step back sometimes fall off the workforce um and dedicate themselves to caregiving one way or the other some are not able to some have the compulsions of having to earn but there are some of us who can take a step back either take deviations into other careers or pause because sometimes caregiving can be so demanding that you have to take a pause uh, not just for child care but sometimes for other other forms of care in that period you do build some skills when you are caregiving what of those skills could be valuable to an organization or a leadership team in your opinion in your experience uh how does caregiving add to the skills pool of an organization uh caregiving has many shades you know so uh, sort of caring uh, and i've uh, you know been through a similar kind of a scenario when i made career choices personally um when i sort of discovered that my my parents were unwell mm -hmm. my father was diagnosed with a terminal uh, scenario and i barely reached in time uh, you know for uh, to be there for him uh, at the time when i went across you know my mother passed away first uh, so that mm -hmm. was completely from the left field and that you know dad passed away 10 days later so in this kind of a scenario i had no option but to you know leave the work that i was doing and sort of come back and restart my life in a different way uh, the only thing that helps you go back into the workforce at that point of time is the kind of marketable skills so at any given point of time being able to have a, a portfolio of skills in my book i talk about three career archetypes okay. uh, career 3.0 is being able to monetize a portfolio of skills across different ecosystems that's three different ecosystems three different skills if you use that as a parameter there's always going to be a time in your career where one skill is going to be you know you'll be an expert in that one skill you you're going to be a novice you are learning and one skill would have become obsolete if i just take a you know very simplified version of this right what it means is being able to look at these caregiving opportunities as caregiving plus learning opportunities what can we learn if that is possible obviously when somebody is on their deathbed their loved one is on the deathbed it's not possible to do that but before and after you know any of these if that becomes you know today building your skill and getting employed are like sequential processes right uh, so you know you kind of you know so that is a big flaw in that system Uh, yeah. that you know you uh, you kind of you learn earn and retire that's the model that's a very industrial age model but right. today uh, the best way to do it is how do you create make sure that the person can create that skill and you know in many of the cases uh, we've worked with individuals to see what works for them yeah. uh, you know sometimes beyond the maternity to be able to give uh, a time span which is imagine it's like a re-onboarding the person because in today's world life changes so quickly that if a person has been out of the workforce for let's say you know uh, two months or three months or four months lot has changed you know people's equations have changed the projects mm -hmm. have changed the customers mm -hmm. have changed the business policies have changed to be able to bring that person back you know and to smoothen the re-entry into the workforce for whichever be the reason could have been caregiving could have been Uh, you know a life event all of that to be able to make that reentry back there are skills that we need to address there are emotional issues to be addressed there are health issues to be addressed and all of that today we kind of address one part of it you have the skills or you don't have the skills yes and i think that binary transactional mode is going to have to change because the world is facing uh you know a very very different demographic shift i mean very yes. few countries have 
a demographic dividend, as we call it. India has the younger people. It doesn't necessarily have all the skills and employability. So we'll have to look at the world's population as one talent pool and sort of really say, what are the right ways in which we can address what can be done by humans, what can be done in conjunction with technology, and what can be delegated to technology? So I think we are going to have to live in this sort of three-factor world, uh, if you will. Yeah, I really like the idea about finding ways of repurposing your experience into something that can be a skill and potentially monetizable. One of the things that I often uh, wonder about is, uh, let's say there is a very large pool of experienced caregivers in our country. Uh, experienced caregivers can, there is no substitute to an experienced yeah. caregiver hand-holding uh, a younger caregiver, uh, both emotionally and with the wisdom uh, and with the life experience. Uh, is that a skill? Is that a skill that can be monetized? Is that a skill that can be put into some kind of a system that works for so many young caregivers? Because um, the challenge around caregiving is also this, that you discover one day that you're a caregiver. You don't plan for it. Yes. You don't train for it. You don't professionally certify yourself as one uh, unless that's your career path. But this is the biggest part of who we are as humans. And the day that you become the caregiver, you are scrambling rather than building that as a skill. But when you are yeah. experienced and you can look back, you can reflect on you know, the range of emotions that you had to go through, um, the, the, the grief that you had to transcend, uh, the ways in which you had to look at life, uh, some of the other life skills can actually give you a bunch of leadership capacity that, um, you know, among other things, that could be very valuable. So I find your uh, insights very uh, thought provoking, as always. Thank you for laying that foundation. I would like for you to um, also take some time and do some blue sky thinking to imagine uh, you know, a future organization and let's say an organization of your dreams and what would uh, that look like? And how would that look at the element of care where people care for each other, people care for animals, people care for the planet? Um, how would a you know, I think uh, the notion of care, uh, if you, as I said, that if you experience the emotion of care towards an individual yeah. or, a, you know, any living being or even the planet, you know, whatever be your, uh, you know, the direction of care, the employment process uh, must reflect that care also. Care mm -hmm. back for the individual employee. We do it today. Uh, in selective ways, so you mm -hmm. know there are there are organizations which will make an exception to the rule because you know the person is really super critical. Uh, so therefore, we sort of do that. So the superstar gets that preferential treatment. Yes, but I think in a fair and just fair and just world, you you, are, you should be looking at the possibility of that being extended uh, much wider. So I think that's the first design principle I would sort of really use. I also think that this is um, a, a shift which is going to be driven by the uh, social factors which are changing. For example, the joint family system in India has uh, sort of you know given way to a far more nuclear structure. Um, yeah. You know, it it's also uh, sort of changed because you look at, uh, you know, there are many more single parents today, you know, and therefore that's another shift that has happened. So th if this is there, th there are other shifts which are social shifts. For example, if you see that because of people working in shifts, you know, the BPO industry sort of made lots of younger people move into shifts. This is different because historically the, it's the parent who has been in shifts and the children have stayed uh, in one place, whereas here it was the other way around. And therefore, mm -hmm. that is nice. a lot of changes in terms of, uh, you know, the equations. If you look at, you know, 
the equation between uh, the spending power as it changes uh, a person's role get you know gets eliminated or people get married divorced etc for multiple life events yes. their earning power changes during that scenario you know you have to rely on a network so i yeah. think one of the ways to sort of really look at it is and kai i think that i would visualize that at some point of time caregiving becomes another mainstream activity it moves along with the world of work so mm. uh, uh, the way to visualize it is that when you watch a foreign language movie uh, you also have the subtitles which are there you know so the movie does not make sense if it does not have the subtitle i think caregiving is that subtitle and if it becomes part of the world of work it's not something which is uh, completely different and alien but it is something where uh you know the cave giving process enables that work it's an enabler just as much as a lot of other things are the policies that you know uh, people say that okay you can uh, um uh, whatever fly in when you go into a different country or a different location in the same way to be able to do that work in whichever way possible you need to be able to enable uh, the care giving process so community um you know, so you have the family if that's getting replaced with the community then those are the kind of things that we are looking at i really like how you have brought in the shifting community and the need for community because as one of my favorite uh, authors dr gabor mate says that uh, you know the reason for uh, a lot of mental health challenges uh, especially mm -hmm. in a capitalist environment is mm -hmm. on account of the fragmenting community so uh, we really need to be cognizant that yes now families are smaller or different or distributed and um, it has its own merits or demerits but we cannot lose the essence of building a community and uh, yeah. workplaces are situated in communities and communities are situated in workplaces so uh what a thrilling conversation abhijit i wish i could go on and on but i know it's very late in seattle and uh i cannot be more grateful for your time uh and generosity uh, thank you very much for uh, bringing me into the conversation my my uh, wish for you is that you know caregiving becomes that subtext that i was mentioning uh, across the world not just in india everywhere and uh, yes. you know in recognition i hope one day um, i will say that i i was speaking to this maxese award winner even before she was nominated good lord <laughs> uh like they say in hindi aapke muh mein ghee shakkar or whatever you prefer <laughs> uh thank you so much for uh for for your guidance input and you know so being so available um so promptly i really value that um thank you for caring for caregiver sathi and for me uh thank you very much thank you so much it is terrific to be here thank you <laughs>